Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think you were all expecting Swamiji Brahmananda, but he was called down to the Pasadena house today. They're having their celebration, their July, their 4th of July celebration in honor of Swami Vivekananda. It's online also. But he was called down to run the camera. <laughs> so you're stuck with me. <laughs> we are reading the gospel, the master with the Brahmo devotees on page 149. And Ramakrishna has just been talking to one of the Brahmo devotees who's been asking about God with form or without form. And Sri Ramakrishna says, it is easier to attain God by following the path of devotion. The Brahmo devotee, sir, is it possible for one to see God? If so, why can't we see him? Master, yes, he can surely be seen. He, one can see his forms and his formless aspect as well. How can I explain that to you? Brahmo devotee, what are the means by which one can see God? Master, can you weep for him with intense longing of heart? Men shed a jug full of tears for the sake of their children, for their wives, or for money. But who weeps for God? So long as the child remains engrossed with its toys, the mother looks after her cooking and other household duties. But when the child no longer relishes the toys, it throws them aside and yells for its mother. Then the mother takes the rice pot down from the hearth, runs in haste, and takes the child in her arms. Brahmo devotee, sir, why are there so many different opinions about the nature of God? Some say that God has form, while others say that he is formless. Again, those who speak of God with form tell us about his different forms. Why all this controversy? Master, a devotee thinks of God as he sees him. In reality, there is no confusion about God. God explains all this to the devotee if the devotee only realizes him somehow. You haven't set your foot in that direction. How can you expect to know all about God? Listen to a story. Once a man entered a wood and saw a small animal on a tree. He came back and told another man that he had seen a creature of a beautiful red color on a certain tree. The second man replied, when I went into the wood, I also saw that animal. But why do you call it red? It is green. Another man who was present contradicted both of them and insisted that it was yellow. Presently, others arrived and contended that it was gray, violet, blue, and so forth and so on. At last, they started quarreling among themselves. To settle the, the dispute, they all went to the tree. They saw a man sitting under it. On being asked, he replied, Yes, I live under this tree, and I know the animal very well. All your descriptions are true. Sometimes it appears red, sometimes yellow, and at other times blue, violet, gray, and so forth. It is a chameleon, and sometimes it has no color at all. Now it has color, and now it has none. In like manner, one who constantly thinks of God can know his real nature. He alone knows that God reveals himself to seekers in various forms and aspects. God has attributes. Then again, he has none. Only the man who lives under the tree knows that the chameleon can appear in various colors, and he knows further that the animal at times has no color at all. It is the others who suffer for, from the agony of futile argument. Kabir used to say, the formless absolute is my father, and God with form is my mother. God reveals himself in the form which his devotee loves most. His love for the devotee 
knows no bounds. It is written in the Purana that God assumed the form of Rama for his heroic devotee Hanuman. Excuse me. The forms and aspects of God disappear when one discriminates in accordance with the Vedanta philosophy. The ultimate conclusion of such discrimination is that Brahman alone is real and this world of names and forms illusory. It is possible for a man to see the forms of God or to think of him as a person only so long as he is conscious that he is a devotee. From the standpoint of discrimination, this ego of a devotee keeps him a little away from God. Do you know why images of Krishna or Kali are three and a half cubits high? Because of distance. Again, on account of distance, the sun appears to be small. But if you go near it, you will find the sun so big, you won't be able to comprehend it. Why have images of Krishna and Kali a dark blue color? That too is on account of distance, like the water of a lake, which appears green, blue, or black from a distance. Go near, take the water in the palm of your hand, and you will find that it has no color. The sky also appears blue from a distance. Go near and you will see that it has no color at all. Therefore, I say that in the light of Vedantic reasoning, Brahman has no attributes. The real nature of Brahman cannot be described. But so long as your individuality is real, the world also is real, and equally real are the different forms of God and the feeling that God is a person. Yours is the path of bhakti. That is very good. It is an easy path. Who can fully know the infinite God, and what need is there of knowing the infinite? Having attained this rare human birth, my supreme need is to develop love for the lotus feet of God. If a jug of water is enough to remove my thirst, why should I measure the quantity of water in a lake? I become drunk on even half a bottle of wine. What is the use of my calculating the quantity of liquor in the tavern? What need is there of knowing the infinite? The various states of mind of the Brahma are described in the Vedas. The path of knowledge is extremely difficult. One cannot obtain jnana if one has the least trace of worldliness and the slightest attachment to lust and greed. This is not the path for the Kali Yuga. The Vedas speak of seven planes where the mind dwells. <coughs> when the mind is immersed in worldliness, it dwells in the three lower planes, at the navel, the organ of generation, and the organ of evacuation. In that state, the mind loses all its higher visions. It broods only on lust and greed. The fourth plane of the mind is at the heart. When the mind dwells there, one has the first glimpse of spiritual consciousness. One sees light all around. Such a man, perceiving the divine light, becomes speechless with wonder and says, Ah, what is this? What is this? His mind does not go downward to the objects of the world. The fifth plane of the mind is at the throat. When the mind reaches this, the aspirant becomes free from all ignorance and illusion. He does not enjoy talking or hearing about anything but God. If people talk about worldly things, he leaves the place at once. The sixth plane is at the forehead. When the mind reaches it, the aspirant sees the form of God day and night. But even then, a little trace of ego remains. At the sight of that incomparable beauty of God's form, one becomes intoxicated and rushes forth to touch and embrace it. But one doesn't succeed. It is like the light inside a lantern. 
one feels as if one could touch the light, but one cannot on account of the pane of glass. In the top of the head is the seventh plane. <clears throat> when the mind rises there, one goes into samadhi. Then the Brahmagyani directly perceives Brahman. And in that state, his body does not last many days. He remains unconscious of the outer world. If milk is poured into his mouth, it runs out. Dwelling on this plane of consciousness, he gives up his body in 21 days. That is the condition of the Brahmagyani. But yours is the path of devotion. That is very good. That is a very good and easy path. Once a man said to me, Sir, can you teach me quickly the thing you call samadhi? Everyone laughed. After a minute, after a man has attained samadhi, all his actions drop away. All devotional activities such as worship, japa, and the like, as well as all worldly duties, cease to exist for such a person. At the beginning, there is much ado about work. <clears throat> as a man makes progress towards God, the outer display of his work becomes less and less so much so that he cannot even sing the name and glories of God, to Shivanath. As long as you were not here at the meeting, people talked a great deal about you and discussed your virtues. But no sooner did you arrive here than all that stopped. Now the very sight of you makes everyone happy. People now simply say, Ah, here is Shivanath Babu. All other talk about you has stopped. After attaining samadhi, I once went to the Ganga to perform tarpan. But as I took water in the palm of my hand, it trickled through my fingers. Weeping, I said to Haladhari, Cousin, what is this? Haladhari replied, It is called Galitahasta, uh, literally inert and benumbed hand, in the holy books. After the vision of God, such duties as the performance of tarpon drop away. In the kirtan, the devotee first sings, Nitai Amar Matahati. Uh, my Nitai dances like a mad elephant. As the devotional mood deepens, he simply sings, Hati, Hati. Next, all he can sing is Hati. And last of all, he simply sings ha and goes into samadhi. The, the man who has been singing all the while then becomes speechless. Again, at a feast given to the Brahmins, one at first hears much noise of talking. When the guests sit on the floor with leaf plates in front of them, much of the noise ceases. Then one hears only the cry, bring some lunch. As they partake of the, oh, bring some luchi. Wait, bring some luchi. As they partake of the luchi and other dishes, three quarters of the noise subsides. When the curd, the last course, appears, one hears only the sound of soup, soup as the guests eat the curd with their fingers. Then there is practically no noise. Afterwards, all retire to sleep and absolute silence reigns. Therefore, I say, at the beginning of religious life, a man makes much ado about work, but as his mind dives deeper into God, he becomes less active. Last of all comes the renunciation of work, followed by samadhi. Generally, the body does not remain alive after the attainment of samadhi. The only exceptions are such sages as Narada, who keep their bodies alive in order to bring spiritual light to others. It is also true of divine incarnations like Chaitanya. After the well is dug, one generally throws away the spade in the basket, but some keep them in order to help their neighbors. The great souls who retain their bodies after samadhi feel compassion for the suffering of others. They are not so selfish as to be satisfied with their own illumination. 
you are well aware of the nature of selfish people. If you ask them to spit at a particular place, they won't, lest it should do you any good. <laughs> if you ask them to bring a sweetmeat worth a cent from the store, they will perhaps lick it on the way back. Everyone laughed. <laughs> but the manifestations of divine power are different in different beings. Ordinary souls are afraid to teach others. A piece of worthless timber may itself somehow float across the water, but it sinks even under the weight of a bird. Sarges, sages like Narada are like a heavy log of wood, which not only floats on the water, but also can carry men, cows, and even elephants. To Shivanat and the other Brahmo devotees, can you tell me why you dwell so much on the powers and glories of God? I ask the same thing of Keshab Sin. One day, Keshab and his party came to the temple garden at Dakshineshwar. I told them I wanted to hear how they lectured. A meeting was arranged in the paved car courtyard above the bathing ghat on the Ganga, where Keshab gave a talk. He spoke very well. I went into a trance. After the lecture, I said to Keshab, why do you so often say such things as, O oh God, what beautiful flowers thou hast made. O oh God, thou hast created the heavens, the stars, and the ocean, and so on. Those who love splendor themselves are fond of dwelling on God's splendor. Once a thief stole the jewels from the images in the temple of Radhakanta. Matur Babu entered the temple and said to the deity, What a shame, O oh God! You couldn't save your own ornaments. The idea, I said to Matur, does he who has Lakshmi for his handmaid and attendant ever lack any splendor? Those jewels may be precious to you, but to God they are no better than lumps of clay. Shame on you. You shouldn't have spoken so meanly. What riches can you give to God to magnify his glory? Therefore I say, a man seeks the person in whom he finds joy. What need has he to ask where that person lives, the number of his houses, gardens, relatives, and servants, or the amount of his wealth? I forget everything when I see Narendra. Never, even unwittingly, have I asked him where he lived, what his father's profession was, or the number of his brothers. Dive deep into the sweetness of God's bliss. What need have we of his infinite creation and unlimited glory? The master sang, Dive deep, O mind, dive deep in the ocean of God's beauty. If you descend to the uttermost depths, there you will find the gem of love. Go seek, O mind, Go seek Brindavan in your heart, where with his loving devotees Sri Krishna sports eternally. Light up, O oh mind, light up true wisdom shining lamp, and let it burn with steady flame unceasingly within your heart. Who is it that steers your boat across the solid earth? It is your guru, says Kabir. Meditate on his holy feet. Sri, Sri Ramakrishna continued, It is also true that after the vision of God, the devotees desires to witness his leela. After the destruction of Ravana at Rama's hand, Nikasha, Ravana's mother, began to run away for fear of her life. Lakshmana said to Rama, Revered brother, brother please explain this strange thing Thing to me. This Nikasha is an old woman who has suffered a great deal from the loss of her many sons, and yet she is so afraid of losing her own life that she is taking to her heels. Rama bade her come near, gave her assurance of safety, and asked her why she was running away. Nikasha answered, O oh, Rama, I am able to witness all this Leela of yours because I am still alive. I want to live longer so that I may see 
the many, thing, the many more things you will do on this earth. Everyone laughed. To Shivanath, I like to see you. How can I live unless I see pure-minded devotees? I feel as if they had been my friends in a former incarnation. A Brahmo devotee. Sir, do you believe in the reincarnation of the soul? Master. Yes, they say there is something like that. How can we understand the ways of God through our small intellects? Many people have spoken about reincarnation, therefore I cannot disbelieve it. As Bhishma lay dying on his bed of arrows, the Pandava brothers and Krishna stood around him. They saw tears flowing from the eyes of the great hero. Arjuna said to Krishna, Friend, how surprising it is. Even such a man as our grandsire, Bhishma, truthful, self-restrained, supremely wise, and one of the eight Vasus, weeps through Maya at the hour of death. Sri Krishna asked Bhishma about it. Bhishma replied, O oh Krishna, you know very well that, that is not, this is not the cause of my grief. I am thinking that there is no end to the Pandavas' suffering, though God himself is their charioteer. A thought like this makes me feel that I have understood nothing of the ways of God, and so I weep. It was about half past eight when the evening worship began in the prayer hall. Soon the moon rose in the autumn sky and flooded the trees and creepers of the garden with its light. After prayer, the devotees began to sing. Sri Ramakrishna was dancing, intoxicated with love of God. The Brahmo devotees danced around him to the accompaniment of drums and cymbals. All appeared to be in a very joyous mood. The place echoed and re-echoed with God's holy name. When the music had stopped, Sri Ramakrishna prostrated himself on the ground and making salutations to the Divine Mother again and again said, Bhagavata Bhakta Bhagavan. My salutations at the feet of the Gyanis, my salutations at the feet of the Bhaktas, I salute the bhaktas who believe in God with form, and I salute the, God, the bhaktas who believe in God without form. I salute the knowers of Brahman of olden times, and my salutations at the feet of the modern knowers of Brahman of the Brahmo Samaj. Then the master and the devotees enjoyed a supper of delicious dishes, which Beni Madhav, their host, had provided. Now, any questions or comments? Because we're going to start a new day. I have a question. Okay. Um, the woman that had lost all her sons and didn't want to die? Yes. It, she was seeing God everywhere. Does that, does that mean that she didn't see good or evil? Well, I think... No, I think that she was... Um, the way they all laughed when she said, oh, Rama, I am able to witness all this Leela years because I'm still alive. I want to live longer so that I s may see the many th more things you will do on this earth. And everyone laughed. I think what it is is she was very attached to body and mind. Her sons and... Um, Relatives were all the Ravana and the demons that Rama was fighting who had kidnapped Sita. So, yes, she was a devotee, but what would you say? She's a human, <laughs> She's a human too. Yeah, she, she was a demon, but obviously had more than Rama. Yes, but not enough to want to be merged with God. Devotion, but a limited devotion. A devotion with um, stipulations, <laughs> I would say. Any other comments? Or qu she was asking about um, Nikasha, how she could 
ask Rama, I want to stay alive because I want to see more of your play. Uh, okay, we have, we'll do a little bit of Wednesday, November 15th, 1882. Sri Ramakrishna, accompanied by Rakhal and several other devotees, came to Calcutta in a carriage and called for M at the school where he was teaching. Then they all set out for the Maidan. Sri Ramakrishna wanted to see the Wilson Circus. As the carriage rolled along the crowded Cheekpur Road, his joy was very great. Like a little child, he leaned first out of one side of the carriage and then out of the other, talking to himself as if addressing the passerby. To M, he said, I find the attention of the people fixed on earthly things. They are all rushing about for the sake of their stomachs. No one is thinking of God. They arrived at the circus. Tickets for the cheapest seats were purchased. The devotees took the master to a high gallery, and they all sat on a bench. He said joyfully, "Ah, This is a good place. I can see the show well from here. There were exhibitions of various feats. A horse raced around a circular track over which large iron rings were hung at intervals. The circus rider, an Englishwoman, stood on one foot on the horse's back and asked and as the horse passed under the rings, she jumped through them, always alighting on one foot on the horse's back. The horse raced around the entire circle, and the, man, the woman never missed the horse or lost her balance. When the circus was over, the master and the devotees stood outside in the field near the carriage. Since it was a cold night, he had, he had covered his body with his green shawl. The master said to M, did you see how that English woman stood on one foot on her, 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 on her, her horse while it ran like lightning? How difficult a feat that must be. She must have practiced a long time. The slightest carelessness and she would break her arms or legs. She might even be killed. One faces the same difficulty leading the life of a householder. A few succeed in it through the grace of God and as a result of their spiritual practice, but most people fail. Entering the world, they become more and more involved in it. They drown in worldliness and suffer the agonies of death. A few only, like Jonica, have succeeded through the power of their austerity in leading the spiritual life as householders. Therefore, spiritual practice is extremely necessary. Otherwise, one cannot rightly live in the world. I think we'll stop there because then they're entering the carriage again and going to Balaram's house. And that will be next week, I think. Let me see what our announcements are. Yes, next week on the 16th, we'll have continue with the gospel reading at 5. Tomorrow, Swami Chid Brahmananda will give the talk, and it will be a master's view. The reading of spiritual treasures on next Wednesday will be here in the temple at 5. Okay. Om Shanti, 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Sri Ramakrishnar Panamastu.